We know that in reading the Bible, the 66 different books of the Bible, that each of those particular books have their own reason for being there. And in being there, they have their own style of writing, their own genre, their own purpose. We know how to divide up the Bible into different sections, the prophetic sections and the wisdom literature and uh, the law of God. When we get to the New Testament, we know what the Gospels are about, documenting the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And we know what the epistles are about. We know what the book of Revelation is about, although we might not all agree on what it's saying. We know what it's about, about Christ's victory over this world. But when we come to the book of Acts, and you may have seen all the charts of what Old Testament books and their divisions in New Testament, we get the book of Acts and we see it as a, a book of historical documentation of what happened after the gospel narratives. But all of the book of Acts, as it's discussing places and locations and incidences that, that happened there, there are themes that are running through it. And I was trying to think of what Old Testament book, the book of Acts, would mostly be like. Does that make sense? What The book of Acts, if it was to be compared to an Old Testament book, which book would it most be like? I don't know, preacher's question. Who needs to struggle over that question, right? But uh, I, I keep having the book of Genesis coming to mind. Because the book of Genesis, I know it's in the law section, the... Of the, of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, but uh, there's a lot of history and travel and things that happen to individuals, uh, like a narrative story, just like we read in the, in the book of Acts. But in the book of Genesis, we have some of the most profound themes that come to us that thread through the entire Bible. And so the book of Genesis, although it talks about all kinds of historical incidences, we learn how God is working with his people, and there are themes that we depend upon to carry us through. It's so much so that people have made the wonderful extrapolation where you see the beginning of things in the book of Genesis being unpacked and then fulfilled in the book of Revelation, how they are both bookends for the entire book. You have a tree of life in the Garden of Eden. You've got a tree of life in heaven. You've got rivers in Genesis. You've got rivers in heaven. It's just this wonderful connection of the themes. So get this, get back on track here, Pastor. Um, the book of Acts also has some important themes, and we've been exploring them. Number one, that the Holy Spirit is real. And the Holy Spirit has a new ministry quite different than what was depicted in the Old Testament. And we also talked about um, in the book of Acts, you know, this is the perfect time for my brain to go, oh, the church is real, all right? That there was a church in the Old Testament, but again, a new dynamic, a new activity in, in the New Testament from the book of Acts. And there's another theme that I wanted to explore with you, and it's always a counter to another theme, but judgment is also a major theme of the book of Acts. And if you talk about judgment, you need the corollary salvation. It's a judgment salvation book. And in fact, almost every single book of the Bible is a judgment salvation motif. So that's what I wanted to explore to you and uh, to do it in the, in the way that many of you are familiar in the Baptist way is just to go through passages, keep those Bible pages moving. They call that the Baptist air conditioner and uh, look at all the specific passages that highlight judgment and to make the case that God's kingdom is accompanied with a judgment of the other kingdoms of this world. And so if a new dispensation of God's spirit coming upon the earth with a new and empowered church is going to come on the earth, it's actually going to speak judgment against this world but will also, in the next breath, provide salvation. But I wanted to break those two uh, items up and distinctly focus on the theme of judgment. Judgment is real. I have a sort of an acquaintance friend back in California who wrote a really good article um, saying that we really 
um, benefit from knowing that God brings judgment. And the essence of that article, which no one wants to hear about judgment, no one wants to hear about wrath and condemnation, but his article said, there is so much injustice, 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 injustice in the world that it would be wrong if there was not a God who rendered judgment ultimately. So many things that go wrong have to be met. Don't you just have your stomach turn when you read some of the things in the news and the people they capture doing things that God has to judge that. Society must judge that. That which is evil and perverse and destroys the lives of other people, it must be judged. And so when the Holy Spirit and the church advance in the book of Acts, you would expect God to make judgments about what true life is about. What being right before God really looks like. And that would hearken to the fact that some things ought to be judged as being antithetical to the work of God's Holy Spirit and His church. And then I watched this, uh, another a video from some friends from my old seminary, and they were talking about how people like to see God of the Old Testament as the judgment God and the God of the New Testament as the all-loving God, and they, they make such a hard bifurcation of those, and the, the video goes on to say, that's not right. God's character is the same throughout. So that God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. There is no change in his character, in his attributes. And in fact, you'll see a pretty uh, forward-speaking God in relation to judgment. Now, here's my interesting question before we peruse through the book of Acts. Upon whom did God bring about the most judgment? When you read the scriptures, upon whom did God bring about the most judgment, the most condemnation, the most execution of wrath? All right, can you think about that for a few moments? I'm not doing the Jeopardy theme song. All right. But you will find, you know, there's characters such as Pharaoh. And we know he came under the harshest judgment. God says, I raised you up to display my power through you. I raised you up for this very purpose, to show you that I'm a God who judges. But you follow the rest of Scripture, and you find out that God actually has the harshest judgments and penalties against his own covenant people, against the people who should know and should do what was right. And uh, Jesus would say, it's for judgment that I've come into this world. And Peter would say in 1 Peter 4, judgment has to start with the house of God first. Um, so for every Pharaoh or Nebuchadnezzar or whomever I could show you, Haman, that I could show you in the Bible, I can show you Korah, who was a member of the covenant people of God. Uh, he and his whole family got swallowed up. I can show you snakes biting the people of Israel for their unbelief. Um, I can see the suffering of the Israelites in the wilderness. Uh, I can show you over and over again that their promised land was looted and pillaged by weather, animals, foreigners. They came under judgment constantly. And these were his elect people who really did endure the judgments of God. So we always want to hide highlight the relief of judgment with the beauty and the promises of salvation which comes again because every time I say this when you look at the cross at the cross that is a place of both judgment and salvation something is judged as being wrong evil and being removed from the sight of God and then something is being saved restored being brought into the glorious presence of an almighty God. And the cross is such a powerful emblem of both this theme of judgment and salvation taking place at the same time. But once again, looking at the idea of judgment from the book of Acts, and we find out that judgment is meted out in very awful and terrible ways uh, to help us understand that like ancient Israel, you could be removed 
from the world and brought into a place where you were experiencing salvation in the sense that you were removed from the world, but God could still come into that place and establish his rule by judging that which shouldn't be in there. Remember what we read in the book of Jude? Jude, all the people that would try to come into the church, the mockers and the despisers, and they would have spiritual language about what they say, but they really didn't know God. They don't know God. They're just playing a role. And God will judge that as well. God is going to judge. I mean, that's why I came to Jesus personally. If you don't mind my personal confession, I was playing church boy. I was just playing the role to get along, to do what I needed to do so that people wouldn't hassle me. And it wasn't real. And I was playing a role and God convicted me of it. And it's like, no, you turn your life over to God, not your acting. So, all right. Always interesting things come to my mind when I look at y'all. So, take your Bibles, first chapter of Acts. It's very interesting as we talk about the great details of the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. There's this ongoing discussion of, a, of an individual named Judas. And the language reference to Judas at 116 and on was this man who came under judgment. And there's this graphic description of how he perishes. And it's with the intent of showing you he came underneath God's disfavor. He was someone who was in the group. <laughs> he was in the covenant community of, of disciples. And yet he was the one who encountered and endured the wrath of God. So just being in the clique, clique, whatever you mean, doesn't save you. <laughs> And Judas is an example of it, and, and his life is prophesied from the Psalms, and we have this very stark warning of what the life of Judas represented and how it ended in the judgment of God. And that's in the first opening chapter of the book. Something is being judged for disobedience and rebellion and being counter to the purposes of God. God judged it in Judas. And then, of course, Acts chapter 2 at verse 19, there's the discussion of what's happening at Pentecost. And the Apostle Peter quotes the Old Testament prophet Joel, and he quotes passages that are related to judgment. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. The day of the Lord has been shown for us in the Old Testament to be a day of judgment. And here salvation is being poured out on Jerusalem. And we wonder, what's the point of this quotation of the book of Joel? Because, as I've alluded to previously, judgment and salvation tend to be right next to each other. That a people will be judged when God comes in his visitation upon his people but that he always takes a people, a remnant that belong to him and saves them out of that judgment. We read about Jehoshaphat in, in 2 Chronicles being concerned about all the armies coming against him. And this one son of a son of a son of a son of a prophesies. And he says, you don't need to fight. God's going to come and save you. And all of that language is just the same language of the Israelites at the Red Sea. And they thought they were cooked. Judgment was coming down on them. And then God takes his elect people out from that and preserves them while others are judged. And so he can speak of Joel. There's going to be a terrible, awful day. But then if you read the end of that section of Joel that is quoted in Acts 2, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That judgment won't touch them. But judgment is coming. It is God's prerogative and his duty to judge that which is sinful and rebellious and arrogant. And the rest of my resume. Turn to Acts chapter 3. We have a discussion of Peter talking to the religious leaders. Verse 22, for Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. That's, Act, that's Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. That, that passage gets referenced a number of times in the book of Acts. 
Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he has to you. And then the verse on the cover of your uh, worship folder. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Is that a verse of judgment or not? And so when Jesus comes to bring salvation, it is true that he also came to bring judgment. And what's happening now in the book of Acts is there's going to be this new division of people who really belong to God. He did it in the Old Testament all the time. Israel was the people that would belong to God. In the judgment, God would pull a remnant out and save them. And now the same thing's happening, though, but it's going to be the church that is going to be pulled out of the people under judgment. They're going to be the unique and particular people of God now. So it's the, it's the recapitulation of themes that we saw in the Old Testament. Acts chapter 4, we have again Peter talking about, in verse 11, this stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. And all of those Old Testament references about people stumbling over the stone and this stone crushing those who would be opposed to him. And then he would turn around again, and this really should be next week's sermon, but there's salvation found in no other for there's no other name under heaven given among men which, by which we must be saved. Do you see the judgment salvation motif being played out there? Acts chapter 5. Do we need to say anything more than Ananias and Sapphira? I mean, isn't this the high water mark of God's judgment upon people in the covenant community? They were playing the game. Oh, people are giving offerings? We can do that. But by the way... We're going to save a little for our 401k and uh, say we gave it all. And then, I mean, without, dead on the spot for their, for their rebellion, for their portrayal of trying to be a person who brings a pure offering before God. We know some, we know some other Old Testament people who tried to bring offerings before God who just got shot down right there. No, no discussion. And so we read after they being judged that a great fear came upon the church. That this new community is supposed to have the reverence and respect of God that you would have afforded him in the Old Testament for all of his exercise of judging the people. But that is the most, one of the most harshest judgments, isn't it, in the book of Acts? That people who are actually carrying the name Christian in their connection were put down in a heartbeat because of their rebellious ways. Acts chapter 7, we have Stephen giving his wonderful recount of the Old Testament history of Israel. And he begins to conclude in verse 51, speaking to the Jewish people who knew all of these stories of their own rebellion. <laughs> he says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. And he goes on again to, to, to give uh, examples of the judgments that God enacts against those who are betrayers and murderers. Um, Israel was used to this motif of the prophets, and the church also needs to be warned, warned of it as all. Well. Um, the Apostle Paul will say in his letters to the Corinthians, these Jewish people of the Old Testament were an example to you so that you may not fall into the same way of doing things that they did. Because God is an avenging God. It's a terrible things to fall into the hands of a living God. Acts chapter 8, there's another section of Peter saying to someone in Samaria who wished he could purchase the power of the Holy Spirit. In verse 20, he says, your money perished with you. We have two incidences, two chapters apart of people mishandling money. And the kingdom of God has nothing to do with money. And he comes under harsh judgment language. 
Simon, this person who thought he could purchase the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and he's told to repent. Again, um, people, we are not playing a game. When we talk about the Holy Spirit and his um, act of sealing us for the day of redemption, his act of uh, imputing to us the righteousness of Christ, his act of equipping us for ministry, his act of bringing to us the spirit of adoption, his act of unifying the church. Uh, you take all those glorious, wonderful, beautiful, precious gifts of God and you cheapen them to your plaything, you will be judged. It's always the most precious things that God is trying to preserve. If they, if, if any old pagan nation tried to come after Israel, the apple of his eye, that which was most precious to them, you don't think that they got a whooping? And when you as Christian don't recognize the beauty and preciousness of the things that God has given to his church to encourage us in our faith, to build us up, to sanctify us, and we ignore them, you don't think we're going to get a whooping? We cheapen too many precious things that God has given us. Oh, I could go on. Mm, I'm going to get in trouble. I mean, the offices that we have have been cheapened in so many churches. The sacraments have been cheapened. The preaching of the Word of God. Those are all so precious. Going to back off there. All right. Um, and then in Acts chapter 9, we see this powerful judgment, salvation, demonstration in the life of Saul, who becomes the Apostle Paul. God judged him on his horse, knocked him to the ground and said, and blinded him. That's all judgment. But tell me uh, a person who would stand before you and say, I am so thankful that God judged me in my wayward ways. And I'm so glad that he chose me to boot off a pony. Because otherwise, I'd still be against him. So the judgment of God turning into salvation. And I confess the same. I'm glad that God drove me to wanting just to end it all. And I don't mean literally suicide, but I was just done. So thankful God brought me to that point. Chapter 10. Here we have uh, a great discussion of the Cornelius' household. And the first thing that Paul says to Cornelius is he says in verse 28, among the first things, he says, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one of another nation. Um, he, the, one of the earliest things he says to Cornelius, whom God has orchestrated this meeting, Peter says, you know, it's against my law that, I even be, that I'm even in your presence because you're a defiled dog. <laughs> you're, a, you're a Philistine of the Philistines. I shouldn't even be keeping company with you. That's all judgment language. And then God's going to say, no, that old language that you used to judge the world, the Son of Man did not come to condemn the world, but to save it. And you're going to have my hand in it. And you would say, the world, the world is worldly. We don't want to be worldly. No, we don't. But uh, people in the world need to hear the gospel. And Cornelius is someone whom I'm, I've set apart to be the instrument to demonstrate to everyone that the world belongs to me now. And so those lang that language of judgment turns into salvation when they become baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 12 there's Herod Agrippa the first. He's a pompous man. He's responsible for killing James, the disciple. He's speaking with uh, a group of people. He's trying to bring um, his authority upon, and they start claiming he's a god, and and he the, he just gets beat down right there. He, he dies in a moment, and his body's eaten by worms. Yes, that's a judgment scene that's taking place here. What, the rulers of this earth should not presume that they have the powers of God. Just a side note there. Acts chapter 13, there's this man named bar Jesus, or Elamas, the sorcerer, as the New King James calls him. He is 
struck down by the curse of uh, the Apostle Paul for his trying to keep Sergius Paulus from hearing the gospel, and he's blinded and Sergius Paulus. It seems as a result of this scene of judgment comes to faith in Jesus Christ. Again, judgment, salvation, situation. <coughs> Acts 13, one of Peter's, excuse me, Paul's greatest sermons that's documented in the book of Acts would quote a judgment passage from the Old Testament. Beware, verse 40, beware therefore lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you, you in this synagogue. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will not by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. Again, he announces a judgment passage upon those who do not trust in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And then we had a really great time when we went through Acts chapter 16 on Paul's second missionary journey. I refer you to that sermon on YouTube. It was really good. I can't say that about many of my sermons. But there Paul and the life and the ministry of him came to judge the world. They judged occultic practices. They, they judged child exploitation. They judged partisan nationalism. They, they judged and condemned the treatment of prisoners and of torture. They exalted the need of due process. And again, in, all the way to Acts 17, he exposes the inadequ inadequacies of Greek philosophy. That's judgment after judgment after judgment of people not living right and doing things not in accord with the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 20. Paul's meeting with the Ephesian elders, and he has a judgment statement. Verse 29, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. What? You know, you could have taken those two verses and thrown them in the story of the Exodus and put Moses said this. People will rise among you and they will try to lead you away from the promised land. And these are judgment passages that are being focused upon the very people of God. Don't fall for the tricks of the wolves. I don't care if you see a wolf saying, it's a wolf. And then the, the book just ends with this, wow, smack him in the face, Paul. I mean, is this the way the book's going to end? Acts 28, he's meeting with some Jewish leaders in Rome. And they say, yeah, we've heard about you. We've heard about the sect. We don't know much about it. And then Paul tells them the mysteries of God, that God had intended to save the world, not just Israel and herself. And then he says, in the conclusion, he quotes an Old Testament passage of judgment. This is in the middle of 26. Go to this people, this is a rendition of Isaiah 6. Go to this people and say, hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts in turn, so that I would, should, heal them. And that's judgment and salvation all right there. Healing is a notion of salvation. Verse 28, Therefore let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear. So, um, not always do we think of uh, the book of Acts as a book of judgment, but I think I've tried to demonstrate pretty clearly that there's judgment throughout. We look to passages like the book of Jeremiah for the real judgment passages. Um, but it's also here within the new covenant people of God in the book of Acts as the church is being established. And once again, to echo the words of Jesus, I have come to bring judgment that those who see will be blind, and those who are blind will see from the Gospel of John. 
And this is, this is his judgment, that some people will be a part of it, that they will be renewed and regenerate by the Holy Spirit, and they will be a unique people able to recognize, yeah, my life is circumspect. I do live with the knowledge that judgment is coming. And on that last day, I am motivated, not out of fear of God's return, and not out of hoping that I make it in, but that his kingdom exists right now, and I'm to walk as a respectful member of it. And in so doing, protect this church from those who would cheapen the church, who would destroy the church, who would take the church and put it into their own fashion. Uh, I, I weep over what's happening in many of our denominations because they... They don't believe in the Word of God anymore. They don't believe in the supremacy, sufficiency of Jesus Christ and His gospel anymore. It's become a social program. It's become a political program. And I don't want to be the crazy evangelical who's just speaking about God's judgment, but I'm not treating God's Word fairly, and I'm not doing you a service to not identify that God brings judgment against that which is against his kingdom, against his rule and authority. But by his grace, he brings people into it so they can be saved and worship and honor God rightly as they ought to be. It's a very interesting phrase that you know who's going to be judged? Those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does it mean to obey the gospel? I thought the gospel was a message of what Christ did for us. Yes, it is. But it conforms all of our life. It's not just a thing that we believe. It's a thing that transforms our mind and our pursuits and our understanding of what's really important in this world. We have to make judgments. And um, we should judge ourselves first. And then seek to protect God's church. Let's pray. Father in heaven, whenever we speak of judgment, we know that we have no right because we're such a failure at so many points. We don't know enough. We don't believe it right. We still struggle with our own proclivities. We just, but we can affirm and acknowledge that you will make all things right one day because there's so many things that are wrong. <laughs> And we pray that you will give us the confidence to know that the judgment that should be meted out upon us has been met in the person of Jesus Christ upon that cross. And that he offers salvation to all who would believe in him. And that you would conform the hearts of your church to live both for that judgment and that salvation. And we pray this in Jesus' name.